My name is John Luther. I work at Google, but I am the product manager of the Web project. Is Christian here? Right here. There you are. How are you doing? Hi, Christian. So Christian knows that I'm not lying when I say that we have an office in Clifton Park. Uh, Christian was our tech uh, stop. He, he was our IT guy there last summer a little bit uh, of a break. So what happened was I worked for a company called Onto Technologies in Clifton Park. We did video compression uh, development of algorithms, and Google purchased us in 2010. So we were acquired, and they kept our office here. Um, is everybody familiar with video compression and codecs and what all that's about? I think so. WebM. How many are familiar with WebM? Oh, good. Okay. So you all know, but for those of you who don't, it's VP8 video codec, which I'm developed. We've, we're developing codecs since 1994. Started in the game industry with Sega Saturn and all these things that probably built before you guys were born. Uh, and then moved into um, things like Flash Player uses VP6, which is one of our codecs. Skype uses VP7, they now use VP8. So we had a long history of developing these things. Google purchased us primarily for the, the knowledge we had and, and the IP. Uh, it uses Morbus Audio and it's in the Petroska container that we say is Petroska based because there's just a few things in the spec that we just didn't have any use for, so we don't support it. And we renamed the container to WebM, so it's a .webM file extension, it's a WebM line type. Uh, launched at Google I.O. May 2010, and it's now, I just checked stack counter yesterday, it's now over 40% of all the web browsers in use in the world now natively support WebM playback in the HTML5 video tag. So, and there's another 11% if you count IE9 and Safari, because we have plugins for those because they don't natively support yeah, we keep going. Um, so that's for what, a year and a half. So it's Firefox, Chrome, and Opera. So those three together. Um, Chrome and Firefox have pretty aggressive updating strategies, whether or not you agree with them. They, as soon as there's a new version, it's pushed to you. So that helps a lot with cycling in new features and things like this, which helped us get to that penetration level in the year. Oops. Sorry, excuse me. Don't read my password. There we go. So these are just some of the companies that um, use WebM or are developing WebM into their products. Uh, I didn't put Google there, but obviously <coughs> primarily through Chrome, but also uh, Google Talk is being migrated to VP8. I don't know if you've used Google Plus yet, but Google Plus Hangouts. Um, there's a whole bunch of it. YouTube is, is now coding videos into uh, WebM for HTML5, but the HTML5 player itself is still uh, opt in. It's an experiment. You, you can opt in to use it if you want, but it's not being served yet by default. And that's mostly due to the fact that a lot of the HTML5 browsers don't have a feature parity yet with Flash, things like full screen. It's, ta it's taken people a long time to get that stuff. There was a big fight about it in the spec, and then it just took forever. So anyway, um, these are just a few of them. There's a whole bunch of others, but these were kind of the biggest and the most recognizable. Uh, so this is just sort of a rundown of what the codecs are capable of for people who claim that they're not. This is there's been a lot of uh, a lot of people don't like what we did with this project because we sort of assumed that H.264 would be the video codec for the web even though it wasn't standardized in the spec but everybody so we came along because 264 has a very um, aggressive IP and royalty schedule you have to pay to use it right here on the web. you can use it for content on the web if the user doesn't pay for the content you don't have to pay royalty user has to pay for the content, say for example, plus Google has to pay a royalty to patent holder. It's a big mess. So we came along and said we think there should be a royalty free option for this. You shouldn't have to pay to use anything in the web stack. You don't have to pay to use HTTP. You don't have to pay to use JPEG. You used to have to pay to use GIF, but they settled that. 
Um, so anyway, that's what we did. But in light of that, there have been people claiming the BPA is no better than 264 baseline, which is simply not true. Uh, so the quality, I know that everything's subjective, but this is the high level. It gives you high level idea of what it's capable of. Um, very importantly, the, the computational complexity of the is about on um, par with baseline that might have caused some confusion. So meaning you can do roughly the same image quality as a high profile 264 with the decoding complexity of baseline 264. So this means that it's a lot easier to decode EPA on less powerful chips, mobile chips, older computers. Uh, you know, with high profile 264 you almost have to have a graphics coprocessor to play the stuff even on a machine like this. The VPA does not so uh, there are no profiles in VPA. I'm sorry. It's not my fault. Google mandates that you have your... Uh, so, the 264 profiles are essentially three different codecs. They're not interoperable. So, we don't have that structure. So, any VPA decoder that's compliant can play any VPA stream created by any encoder that doesn't screw up this range which is uh, very useful because a lot of websites like YouTube, they have to maintain baseline encodes for mobile and main encodes for older PCs and high profile. So it gets rid of all that confusion. Um, it also has a lot of features designed specifically for real-time scenarios like video conferencing. It's, that's why Skype uses it. Logitech uses it. And it's being proposed for inclusion in the WebRTC open source project, which is a standards project at the IETF to standardize do video conferencing in the browser instead of having all these plug in the And you're probably, I mean, most of you are probably familiar with Warbus and what it's capable of. Also, a lot of fun around Warbus being no good. I mean, it's certainly getting close, I mean, it's, it's certainly as good as MP3, but getting pretty close to AC, and I know those guys pretty well. And they have a lot of plans for. So the goals were um, for video on the web. We're not interested in CDs, or DVDs, or cable boxes. This, this is video served over HTTP, and that's what we do. That's all we're interested in. Uh, so what that means is we, in future codecs as well as VPA, it's designed for that scenario. A lot of the standards codecs that have been developed in the past were developed for broadcast television. It's sort of then munged around to fit the web model. And for that reason, they have a lot of shortcomings that we're trying to uh, improve upon, essentially. Get rid of. So this is priority number one is just, you know, video on the web should not be a substandard experience. A lot of people, especially when you talk to cable companies and people who don't know much about the internet, they say, well, it's every, they make the YouTube jokes. Well, it's just a bunch of kids skateboards, it's absolutely not true. You all know what is capable of, you know, video is capable of on the web. But a lot of the, the technologies that are in use just weren't built for it. So you get things like this, you know, spinning beach ball while you wait for the video to start. There's really awful caching problems and it's not built for this scenario. We're going to try to fix that. Uh, the goals have it in all browsers that support the HTML5 video tag. Um, People ask us why we have proposed it as the uh, baseline format for the video tag in the standard. I don't know if you follow the what WG working group mail was when they when they proposed Theor for this, there was a huge fight and we just didn't want to get involved with that. So that's why. Um, so you know, the open choice is very important because like I said, there's no barrier to entry for any other part of the web stack. Why should there be for video? Audio is kind of becoming in the middle. The patents on MP3 are due to expire pretty soon, so that will be um, royalty free pretty soon. But of course, the people who collect royalties for that are also very involved with AAC. So it's kind of a constant reference to for them. So there should be a choice for anybody who wants to put video on the web. There should be a choice for you guys to do research, hack away at whatever you want to hack away at, and not have to pay anybody a royalty. Like if you made a software uh, product, an open source product that you used 264, even though you developed it, anybody who wanted to use it in mass volume, let's say, 
100,000 machines that were downloaded. You'd have, they would then have to go pay 25 cents to the MPEG-LA to use your product. It's a crazy, weird system. Um, so, and, you know, we believe that open software uh, creates innovation. It's just the nature of it. We have as many people working on something as want to work on it and are very motivated to work on it because they're interested in it. Innovation happens faster. You get much better results that way. That's just what we believe. Not everybody agrees with that, but uh, it's free. Um, so hardware is also important. I mean, even though the complexity, we don't have the same problems, it's still very important for mobile devices, things that have batteries in them, because battery technology is dismal. And if you run video and software, it's free battery. So you almost have to have some kind of hard, offloading hardware um, operations, even the scaling and things like that. Anything you can do on hardware helps. Um, and it should be easy. You shouldn't have to understand B frames or levels and all this stuff. Most VPA encoders, at least the one that we maintain, you just sort of put a video in and get one out. It does a lot of stuff to figure out things for you so that you don't have to have these massive long commands for this. Um, and tools are very important, uh, especially the open tools, FFmpeg and encoder and things like that are very important to what we do. So, why would you want to contribute to this? Well, other than it being really cool, it's pretty interesting technology. It's very um, obviously, you know, the algorithm part of it is. Software implementations of algorithms are interesting to work on because I could write one and it would be awful because I'm not an engineer. You guys could write one and it would be infinitely better because you know what you're doing. <laughs> so um, it's, it's not like, you know, I don't write it or something. So it's, there's a lot of engineering that goes into doing it right. It takes a lot of skill. So it's interesting. It's also you get to interact um, with Google engineers. A lot of the guys are working on this work at Google. So that, you know, as far as future employment goes, the more people you know at Google, the easier, well, not easier, it helps. There's no easy way to get hired at Google, I've learned. But, um, but if you were interested in working there, it helps a lot in your interviews to know how the place works. Because it works on like any other place you have to work probably. So having that familiarity, um, Seeing how a really large open project works and being involved with it uh, with engineers and people working on this all over the place. It's not, you know, it's obviously it's not Firefox or anything that massive, but hopefully it's okay. Uh, you could work on something that millions of people use. Um, Firefox 4 or 5 is now 300 million people across 100 some odd million. So there's tens of millions of people. Um, and that's, that makes no sense. What that, what that means is uh, this is the first time anybody has, I mean, they tried with Fiora and Orbis. It didn't, um, and now also the other thing that on to is we developed VP3, which was the base of the So we're pretty familiar with it. The problem that they faced is they didn't have anybody backing them. Independent developers mostly, and you know, unfortunately, good or bad, Google's behind this 100%. Helps to have those resources and that kind of cloud to you know, put it in something like Chrome, whereas the had to struggle to fight to get it into Firefox. So anyway, um, this is going to be very important for technology, not just web and UK, but all video formats, audio formats, all this stuff is going. Um, and then you can also, we also have an experimental branch in our repo that you can do research, you can put ideas there, things crazy for you, um, to help find the next one. So our VPA is done. We, uh, the bitstream is frozen. We can't change it because all these people when we launched it, we were very excited to put hardware, and they were freaked out. We said, well, 
we're going to change it next year because their timelines are three years. I mean, there are some item chips today that won't ship until 2004. So we're not changing the bitstream PK, the encoder, obviously, the decoder strategies, those used can always be improved. But if you were interested in just your development of the codec, you could contribute to BP next by working in the experimental branch. So uh, specifically, what we are looking for, um, I mean, all of you guys know this, you know, the more you're involved in the project, the more influence you have. Seriously, people take you, you may become a reviewer at some point. Uh, um, so, the quality improvements in the encoder, uh, it's gotten a lot better since we launched it. It could be a lot better. Um, something like porting X264, if you're familiar with that, they've talked about doing a VPA port of that, but it's just kind of stalling. That would be cool to have. Um, in other words, an X264 encoder that outputs a VPA. Uh, it says the experimental branch. Uh, just as one example, there's something where this is, I should say, two paths. Uh, so if you have a multi core processor, you can do the first pass in one core and then delay it by whatever interval of time. You do the second pass using a stash generator. The first pass, so you get two paths encoding in quote, real time. It's not real time, but it's very close. Uh, a lot of people we've talked to are very interested in this because the quality of the two passes is much better. Uh, but the speed difference is not much greater than one pass. Uh, speed improvements in the encoder itself. Uh, presets for FemPeg, we have some that we've done, but we could, uh, if you look at the presets that get installed for 264, there's like 20 of them. So far, we've tweaked about. So that's something that definitely needs to be done for, because um, I mean, I don't know if anybody probably in the ball used it at some point. It's a bit tricky to, uh, to use, and if you're somebody new coming to it, you're not going to have a very, very steep curve. Uh, sorry. Uh, and then tools, things like Handbrake, which is an open source uh, video conversion. It's a good we think you know, put a video in and you say make me one make me a video that'll play on an iPad for outcomes. Having a VTA output in the that would be cool. Myro, they've already uh, they, the Myro video converter, which is a little drag and drop thing, supports WebM, but its presets are not that great. I'm working with them now, but they're very stretched with a whole bunch of stuff. It's things like WinFF, which is another of these sort of drag and drop file. Uh, TVRs, with TV, uh, Sage TV was, was a similar thing. Google bought it, um, so they're hopefully going to integrate it soon as well. Okay, uh, so this is the site <coughs> mailing list. There, there are other mailing lists, but you can find those on the site. There's the NRC channel, it's usually pretty lively. Do you have any questions? I didn't even thank you. Sorry, the slide is just in the back. In the back? Yeah, um, I did see a news a while back that uh, M. Pegalay was talking about forming a patent pool for EPA. Mm -hmm. Now, I didn't hear of anyone actually filing any patents to the patent pool. Mm -hmm. Was that just sort of posturing? Did anything ever come of that? They, they, all they've done is talk about it. They have claimed, probably the story you read, they claim yeah. 12. Uh, entities who claim to have IP that reads an EPA. That was, uh, well, first they said in February they said they were going to form this pool. They had a deadline in March, something. They extended the deadline, and then all of a sudden they said we would follow. I, my response was okay, I want the names of that members until you give me those. Out. That's the position. I mean, Google is putting this in everything. Uh, so one thing that I think is responsible for a huge proliferation of 264 is hardware-based decoders, right? So yep. my phone or, like you mentioned, the iPad or whatever, there are hardware decoders for 264. Mm -hmm. um, are you guys involved at all with getting sort of hardware support for WebM? Because yep. I think yep. that's sort of 
that would hamper success of the format. Do you know what I mean? I, I, I know exactly what you mean. I spent a large amount of my time on uh, the, the other thing is those, they're very important, and I, they're not as, they're not as, as uh, widely installed as people think they are. There are a lot of phones that only do baseline because that was the one that was only, I mean, anybody knows phones now are perfectly capable of some of doing high profile hardware. But, um, so, these guys, these guys, these guys, these guys, and they're smaller. I mean, a lot of these companies source this stuff to other companies that know they're heard of it. There's a company in China called Foxconn that makes, makes these. Apple doesn't make these. They designed them in California. And then they have them built in China. So the people who make the actual chips take them out and fab them and everything else. They're companies like ST, like Brown. But when we talk, we're talking about with all those guys. And they all have plans to make these chips. That would take so long. So uh, there are a couple of them on the market now, but 